This is a sequel to my talk from 1993, or it might be 1994. <laughs> I don't actually know, um, because for some reason it dropped off my CV at some point. So I, if anybody, I'm not sure anybody was actually here um, back in those days. Were, were you? I, I, you probably don't remember, um, because it was very insignificant. Uh, but in any case, um, 25 years ago, I spoke on um, the topic of of the system of equations one that you can see on the board. And so I can give part of a punchline of this talk, which is that there are counting functions for the number of solutions of, of these equations. So I'm interested in counting the number of solutions um, of the equation, which might be um, one, two, or three, where the variables are in absolute value it must be. And I, I won't worry about um, making these projective points um, by insisting on a coprimality condition. That's something that one can do after the event if one wants to. Um, but the, the punchline, at least for, for part of this, is that the first two of these equations are, are well understood, pairs of equations. Sorry, question? Integer solutions. Integer solutions, yes. These are all integer solutions, rational integer solutions. solutions. So this first counting function um, is uh, very close to, well, 2b is the number of choices, basically, for the variable x sub by itself. So it's very close to a combinatorial factor times 2b cubed. And there's a, some absolute constant, which I'll call c1, which determines what happens to uh, the second order term, it grows like b squared log b to the fifth. The second counting function is asymptotic to another constant, which I'll call c subscript 2. Um, and this time it grows like b to the sixth. And the third one, <laughs> I can see there's a symmetry of erasers down <laughs> behind the blackboard there. <laughs> I'll try to uh, not drop any more down there. Um, so the third one, aha, this is really the subject of this talk. Um, and I guess you should not uh, be too surprised. So the explanation for part of what goes on here is, is fairly clear. So in the first problem, there are six variables. The sum of the degrees in these equations is 3 plus 1, that's 4. So you might expect that the number of solutions might grow like b to the 6 minus 3 <coughs> minus 1, so that's b squared, and some mysterious factor log b to the fifth there. In the second problem, the number of choices for the variables is b to the 10. And again, if we apply the same principle, the sum of the degrees is 4, so b to the 10 minus 4 is the rate of growth here. So you should expect that the rate of growth here for a one cubic equation, two different linear equations, you should expect that the rate of growth here should be like b to the fifth. And the question is, what happens with this, um, with this term here? Can one really prove anything? And is this, is this third problem going to be easier or harder than the others? Well, usually the more equations you add with the same number of variables, the harder things become. So this ought to be harder. Um, and in this talk, um, this is, of course, it's a serious talk, but it's uh, more amusing because um, in many ways this problem is easier than um, problem two, surprisingly, even though there's, there are extra equations for it. It's important that we split 1 to 6 and 7 to 10, or does any 2 linear implies we split? That's a very good question. So um, you'll see that actually the split is pretty important. So if you give me your favorite split, unless your favorite happens to be that split, <laughs> uh, I'm not necessarily going to be able to do much of it. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. OK. Is two easier than one? Is two easier than one? Um, yeah, what is easier than something else? Um, <laughs> they're different kinds of technologies. So, so two, well, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. So, so, so let's, let's wind the clock back uh, to 25 years ago. Uh, when 
I had recently moved to the United States. It's, uh, it's back to the future all over again. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> so back uh, 25 years ago, Bob Vaughan and I, and I, I think this was in late 1993, or early 1994. Um, so I gave a talk in this, this seminar on exactly this counting problem, uh, n1 of b, and this was joint with uh, Bob Vaughan. And it was all motivated by, um, so the paper appeared in 1995. The paper was called um, On a Certain Nonary Cubic Form, a cubic form in nine variables. It was all motivated by some thesis work of uh, Kent Bockling at the time, which made use of this, this problem. So the classical result um, in connection with this problem is that uh, n1 of b is bounded by b to the 3 plus epsilon. So here I mean that for any positive number epsilon, there's a constant depending on epsilon, which gives an upper bound for the growth rate of this function, which is like b to the 3 plus epsilon. And by classical, um, well, this had very recently been studied by, uh, by Borgan at that time on work on the KDV equation. And he observed that if you, uh, uh, if you subtract the cube of x1 plus x2 plus x3 from, ah, well, that's uh, <laughs> not quite right, is it? So. <laughs> That deep observation was that that was zero. <laughs> uh, a slightly less deep observation. <laughs> okay, so, so if I subtract the sum of the cubes from uh, the linear expression x1 plus x2 plus x3 all cubed, this factorizes very nicely. So, so you get something which at first looks miraculous, and then when you play around with these things, you realize it's not at all miraculous. So you have this nice multiplicative structure. And what this means is that in this uh, system of equations one, if I fix x4, x5, and x6, then morally speaking, um, the product of these integers is going to be equal to whatever that fixed object was. And unless it's zero, you've got a sort of a divisor function in play here. So that means that it's very easy for that fixed choice of uh, x4, x5, x6, b cube choices there, to show that there are b to the epsilon choices for the remaining variables. And if this is actually zero, then life gets even easier. So, so that was what Borgan um, observed. And if he'd read the recent literature, he would have discovered that uh, Heath Brown had uh, come up with exactly the same idea and proved exactly the same bound in 1988. Um, so it's good to read the literature. Uh, but if Heath Brown had read the literature, <laughs> then um, he would have noticed this book by Hua, which was standard reading for anybody studying the circle method before uh, Vaughan's book on the Heidi Littlewood method. It's this book by Hua on additive prime number theory, which does exactly the same thing. So that's the English translation of the German edition in 1959. <laughs> of the Chinese edition in 1953 and the Russian edition in 1947. So, <coughs> so it is good to read the literature. I think that's the message here. It's, uh, it's sometimes you learn things. OK, so, um, so what's the point? So this is not the same asymptotic formula. It's just an upper bound for the number of solutions. And this is much more detailed. Um, so first of all, what's the origin of this combinatorial factor 15? So if we, if we look at the, the system one, then there are all kinds of linear solutions, um, the linear spaces of solutions, such as x1 plus x2 equal to x3 plus x4 equal to x5 plus x6 equal to 0. So that's always a solution. And so you can see that um, the solutions of this type already contribute to b roughly 2b cubed um, integer solutions. And of course, uh, the choice of uh, the indices 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 6, that can be done in several different ways. And if you compute the combinatorial factor corresponding to all the different ways, you could do this 
uh, then you get a, a factor 15 for the number of these linear spaces of solutions. So, uh, so this first term corresponds to those trivial solutions, those linear spaces of solutions. Um, so this is where um, Vaughan and I got interested in this problem. And at the time that we were working on this, we found a way which I, I won't go into um, in any great detail, but we found a way of showing that the number of solutions, you could parameterize them. And this was in the, the early days of uh, these investigations on rational points, which were connected later on with, uh, um, with uh, Manning pair conjectures. And pairs conjecture didn't even exist at that time. Um, so we were able to show that the upper and lower bounds for the growth rate of what's left over, which grew like b squared log b to the fifth. And that was somewhat mysterious to us. This was roughly the time when I gave this talk. Um, log b to the fifth was an unexpected factor in those days. So these days, thanks to all the work on the Manning pair conjectures, um, there are good reasons for suspecting that this log b to the fifth should exist. Um, it is what would be the projected, what the predicted rate of growth for the number of points which do not lie on special subvarieties. So these linear spaces of solutions are special subvarieties in this context. Um, so we wanted to explain this, and um, our explanation was via a heuristic for the circle method. And I just want to say a few words about this. It's <clears throat> in some ways a bit of a shaggy dog story, but it's, um, it's good motivation for what happens later on. <laughs> I'm going to talk uh, in several directions and try to confuse you so that you'll accept what I say at the end of the, the talk. Uh, it's a diversionary tactic. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a sort of convoluted story. Is it? Yeah. That, does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, so we, we actually called this, for, um, at the time, uh, Sarnak and uh, Rudnick and Bill Duke had a paper about um, Hardy Littlewood systems, where they tried to formalize some work that uh, Schmidt had made. So we called these, Bob and I called these quasi Hardy Littlewood systems, where the uh, applicability was more general and more. Um, applied to situations in fewer variables. So let me just say a few words about what we had in mind. So we're going to apply the, the hardy littlewood method. And so I, I write down an exponential sum. So, so this is the, uh, the basic exponential sum. And then this biophorganality this counting function, which I'm interested in, is an integral around the unit square of f of alpha beta to the 6 d alpha d beta. Um, <coughs> maybe it's worth noting that this is actually a, a real number, if you think about what's going on here. It's self-conjugate, so I don't even need the absolute values if I don't want to use them. Um, and <clears throat> with a circle method, you try to understand the solutions by uh, analyzing what goes on on uh, major and minor arcs. So in this context, we're major arcs. And maybe um, to illustrate what I have in mind, um, I'll just define something here. So this is going to be the union of intervals, um, union of unit squares. So these are points alpha beta in the unit square with rational approximations which are, are good in a sense which we can make precise. And this parameter q. For the purposes I'm talking here, just think of Q as being a small power of 
a B. Maybe one over a million or something, or one over a hundred. So these are major arcs in the problem. And then the minor arcs are just going to be the complement in the unit square of these major arcs. <coughs> so based on um, the kind of heuristics which were circulating um, among the cognoscenti in the circle method at the time, we speculated that the, the minor arc contribution should really give the, the trivial solutions in this problem that we were interested in. And in this case, these are linear spaces of solutions. And by minor arcs, I really mean the integral over the set of minor arcs of f of alpha beta to the 6 d alpha d beta. And the major arcs, we should give um, the product of local densities in the problem. And these should correspond to the typical solutions. And it's a fact in the circle method, a working fact, that the major arcs are something which, with enough effort, you can usually figure out how to uh, calculate precisely. So we showed, provably, that this product of local densities, this major arc contribution, grows like b squared log b to the fifth in this problem which corresponded to what we were also able to prove um, by uh, analyzing parametric solutions, a sort of parameterization of the solutions, what these days would be called a, a sort of a torsor approach. Um, now, the minor arc contribution is more mysterious, and we could only make um, conjectures about what, what happens there. Um, but in formulating this, this explanation, um, we were sort of led, as a consequence of a conference talk and, and uh, feedback from the talk that happened here 25 years ago, to think about um, how this all corresponded with Manin's conjectures at the time. And Manin had a, an approach um, to understanding the rational solutions of uh, suitable varieties, in particular flag varieties, which identified um, special sub-varieties so there could be special sub-varieties such as these linear um, linear spaces, which we have in this problem. And then there should be something which is an accumulating term corresponding to to a product of local densities. And so it's pretty clear that there was a correspondence between what the harmonic analysis side would say about this, this sort of philosophy, the harmonic analysis going on in the circle method, and what Manin was saying, which was, um, and his collaborators, which was more of a, a, an algebra, algebraic or geometric um, flavor. And so this actually prompted us to think about what would happen in greater generality. So your solution yep. you get if you um, normalize by, I think that, um, right, by scaling, mm. is the density in the angular sense? Uh, it's for that, so if you restrict to, um, to a cone? Yeah. Um, yeah, you can prove, you could prove that this would, I mean, it was an equidistribution property um, to the rational points um, subject to that kind of conical restriction. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, of course, the way um, Manny et al. set this all up is with um, the anti-canonical height. Uh, you split um, up the variety of Manly tests. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and this is the point that I, that I want to make. So, um, so why is this connection between the harmonic analysis and Manin's philosophy sensible? I mean, it was something which was certainly 25 years ago was rather poorly understood. But if I, um, if I think about um, my variety, uh, I can think about linear spaces of solutions on this variety or some other special sub-variety of a variety. And the harmonic analysis um, doesn't see these, these smaller dimensional objects. As far as the harmonic analysis goes, well, the harmonic analysis actually sees everything. That's something I, I always try to, you know, you do a computation with a circle method, you're using orthogonality to count things, so you are really counting everything. But um, the heuristic which we're familiar with, which really corresponds to looking at um, low height rational, rational points or something which is essentially linear analysis, that doesn't see these lower dimensional objects at all. Uh, this has smaller measure and so um, the contribution to the, the main term, what we think of as the main term, is, is vanishing. So these special sub you have to tell the harmonic analysis to look at these as separate objects. Um, and in Manin's philosophy on this, I mean, you, you see from the algebraic point of view that these objects you have to account for separately. And from the circle method, uh, likewise, you have to identify these special sub and deal with them separately. But it's very clear that the major arcs in the problem are, are finding the typical points um, away from the, the special sub And the minor arcs have to, by default, um, detect everything else. It's just that we don't know how the minor arcs detect those things because minor arcs uh, correspond to large height uh, real numbers in the harmonic analysis side, which are very difficult to understand. Um, and I won't have time to say anything about this, I suppose, but this same kind of philosophy now is, um, is clearly at work in recent work uh, devoted to moments of Riemann zeta function by Connery and Keating, which is a rigorous heuristic, whatever that means, um, for... <laughs> computing the main term. So, so you, there's this connection with random matrix theory. Um, random matrix theory correctly predicts, apparently, the, uh, the growth of the um, moments of the Riemann zeta function. And the Connery-Keating heuristic um, gives a sort of a, an analytic way to disentangle this, these predictions for the main terms. Um, but at least initially, this was kind of a black box. It was a recipe rather than anything with um, I was going to say underlying logic, um, that gives a negative impression. It was rather difficult to see why you would follow this recipe. And it's clear that this, um, this philosophy in terms of uh, special sub or analogues of special sub in the, the moments of zeta sense also gives the right way to think about these problems and explains why this rigorous heur heuristic really makes sense and is logical. In fact, in hindsight, it's the only sensible thing you could ever have done. Um, yeah, I, I was, maybe I should say this anyway. I was going to give another example, which is my favorite example, which maybe you'll disagree is really an example of what you're looking for, but it comes close to it. So, um, so if I look at, uh, problem of um, three fourth powers being a sum of three fourth powers. And I've, my count is all wrong here, isn't it? Um, too many fours and fives, right? Okay, so I think I, I, I got the indexing right. So if I count solutions here, then of course there are linear spaces of solutions just like before, right? So the, the sort of a diagonal combination, so 2b cubed, choices where x1 is equal to x4, x2 is x5, and x3 is x6. And I guess there's um, 
there's some combinatorial factor, free factorial, and maybe I'm missing an extra power of two there as well, probably. But these are diagonal solutions where x1, x2, x3 um, is equal to um, sort of, uh, maybe I'll put absolute values here, is equal to x4, x5, x6. So we knew, we knew those were going to exist all along. That's no escaping that. And you can also work out the product of local densities in this prob problem. So the product of local densities, or in other words, the, um, the major arc contribution. So this is all um, within scope of the circle method. And we know that the, the major arc contribution grows like a constant times b squared. That's provable. Um, you can trust me on that. Um, but and so you might be tempted to believe that those are the only solutions. But in fact, there's another set of solutions as well. So if I write x3 equal to x1 plus x2 and x6 equal to x4 plus x5, um, so if I substitute um, this uh, arrangement into the equation, then there's another nice polynomial identity which is at play here. So this happens to be twice x1 squared plus x1 x2 plus x2 squared. And that means that you have solutions whenever you have solutions of the equation uh, x1 squared plus x1 x2 plus x2 squared equal to x3 squared plus x3 x4 plus, I got that all wrong really, haven't I? So x4 squared plus x4 x5 plus x5 squared in the same box. And this is an example of a, of a quadric where you know that the growth of the number of solutions for this is like a constant times b squared log b. So it's uh, sort of growing a bit faster than the square root cancellation. There's a combinatorial factor you can slip in here as well. But this is an extra set of solutions which isn't accounted for by the diagonal which really morally corresponds to square root cancellation and the product of local densities. It grows faster than the product of local densities. So it's another special subvariety, which once you've spotted it, in hindsight, of course, it was obvious that those points were going to contribute. And it's kind of a similar picture to this, isn't it? But, uh, but this is of lower dimension. It's not picked up by the harmonic analysis from the main term. Um, but it's certainly there, and you have to tell the harmonic analysis to, to count these solutions separately. Yeah. So the square root cancellation is d cubed. Is there examples where the accumulating thing would be more than square root of the. Oh, um, or does that uh, maybe if you have something inhomogeneous or, or something highly singular, I suppose. Yeah. If, you, if you're singular enough, you could. I see, but it doesn't yeah. happen for smooth shouldn't happen for smooth homogeneous things, I, would, I, I think. I mean, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you're, you're right. Um, OK, so <coughs> I notice we have fancy uh, chalk here, but this is the fancy eraser that I brought with me. So, um, so I'm going to uh, hopefully tempt you into believing that this is a good thing. Uh, I'm not going to drop it. <laughs> uh, very good. OK. So, um, so it was all this um, sort of work which was going on in the background 25 years ago on this uh, system of equations one, which uh, later on we discovered is the Segre cubic. But we didn't know that at the time because, well, I was young and innocent, and Bob didn't know about those things. So. Um, so what can I say about um, uh, the system of equations two? So is this easier or harder? So I, I don't want to spend very much time on this because I'll run out of time. But um, I can give you some indication of what's going on. So, so you might remember Hua had written quite a lot about uh, useful stuff 
starting in 1947. And he didn't constrain his, his uh, investigations to the system one. He also gave um, something interesting concerning the system two. So he was able to show that the counting function here grows no more rapidly than b to the 6 plus epsilon for any positive number epsilon. And basically, if you know a little bit about the circle method, it's not too surprising. The, the rate of growth for the sixth moment was like b to the 3 plus epsilon. And we've got four extra variables. You could apply some kind of vial differencing um, for cubes. The vial's inequality has exponent 3 quarters, so 4 times 3 quarters is b cubed. You expect fairly easily to be able to get a, an upper bound, which is like b to the 6 plus epsilon. But it's one of these problems where saving epsilon is, is really a tough business. It's, it's a cubic problem. Um, it's rather difficult to persuade these problems to, uh, to um, save their epsilons. Um, there is a technique for doing this, which uh, Boudin and Robert investigated. So their work goes back before 2015. It was published in 2015. Um, so I, I guess at least a couple of years b before 2015. Um, and what they were able to, to do is to show that um, this counting function grows like a constant b to the 6 with an error term where you do save something. In fact, you save a, a log b squared. And this goes by this uh, technique involving Hooley delta functions. So there's a bit of multiplicative number theory involving um, very careful analysis of the size divisors of integers in an average sense. And uh, this had been introduced by Bob Vaughan in work on sums of eight cubes, quite famously in the mid-80s. And so Bruden and Robert used similar ideas to, to save um, a power of log in this problem. And really what's going on is for minor arc contribution, you, you win that power of log. Um, so about the same time, um, <coughs> I found a way to use uh, the resolution of the main conjecture um, in Vinogradov's mean value theorem in the qubit case, which is what I proved in early 2000, 2014. And that does very well in these cubic problems. So the net effect of that is that, in some sense, you improve the minor arc um, estimate in this problem. So instead of saving just log b squared, you would actually save um, b to the 1 quarter in this problem. In a sense, you very nearly prove a result in 9 nine variables instead of 10 variables. You miss by an epsilon there. So with 10 variables, you're amply inside of everything. And in this case, if Akshay has a very special linear slice, which he's very keen on, then um, it would make no difference to this result. So this would be, still be OK, provided that not too many coefficients in your linear slice were 0. So, um, OK, so. Um, so both of these techniques are quite powerful, I suppose. I mean, in terms of paper space, this one is, is quite a lot of paper. This one is much less, but you're using the proof of a main conjecture in Vinogradov's mean value theorem in the qubit case, which is quite a heavy hammer already. Um, but they're quite tough results. And, and uh, compared to the, uh, the system one, which we were talking about earlier, um, there, the techniques are, are in some sense elementary in a strict sense, but they take a lot of space. Um, uh, in this case, Manin would, would also predict um, this kind of result. This is, 
in some sense, the Manning conjectures in this case just predict what the circle method um, would, would predict because there are enough variables. But this can come from linear subspaces. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's, a good, it's a good question. So in this, um, in this problem, the linear subspaces, you can see the variables um, could pair off. And so the contribution from the linear subspaces would be b to the fifth. So, um, so the, the special subvarieties uh, grow something like b to the fifth. So it's small order. It's somehow invisible. And actually, a more refined analysis, I, I guess, would, um, would begin to impact this. So you might be able to start to think about these things in looking at second and higher order terms. Um, so. That's, that's one extra slice, right? So, so in some sense, this is like a cubic in nine variables rather than 10, if you eliminate one of those variables. Um, so what about two slices, which is system three? So this is supposed to be harder because we've got more equations. Um, but at least we know. Uh, what to predict. So if you believe in this, in this heuristic that uh, Vaughan and I had, you would predict that um, the uh, number of solutions should be predicted by the product of local densities from the major arcs, together with the contribution from all the special subvarieties. So in this case, we do have special subvarieties. We have linear spaces. Um, and these linear spaces, well, a typical linear space would be x1 plus x2 is x3 plus x4. And you see the pattern is x9 plus x10 equals 0. But there are many different ways that you can um, choose the pairs of variables to give vanishing. And um, we've already seen that the, the six, first six variables, you can choose them in pairs um, in 15 different ways to give linear spaces. And that leaves the problem of dealing with the last four variables. So there are 15 2b cubed choices for these linear spaces on the first six variables. And you can check for another 2b um, squared times a combinatorial factor 3 for the remaining four variables, x7 up to x10. And so the contribution of these linear spaces is roughly 45 times 2b to the 5. And the product of local densities Well, you can compute this as well. Um, it's C3, something I'll call C3, which is a product of real and piadic densities. So, um, so this chi p, I'll define everything so that you can see, um, is the limb as h goes to infinity of p to the h to the minus 7. Um, 7 because there are 10 variables and 3 equations times the number of solutions where the variables uh, in Z mod P to the H, Z. There we are, I'm being bilingual. Uh, so that three um, holds. OK, and it turns out that this is uh, 1 plus big O of P to the minus 3 halves. So everything converges nicely. And the real density. I can define as the limb as eta go. People should define the singular integral in this way. This is the, the most sensible way to define it. So use a sort of a sandwich theorem. So it's what Siegel did. It's a Siegel volume. So you look in the in a unit cube. And you replace each of the equations by an inequality. So something of width, a small number, eta. So sort of a, 
you put a sandwich around your variety of width eta divided by the appropriate quantity. And this is defined. There's no problem about that. And it's actually the same as for the usual singular integral if you define that formally via Fourier analysis. So um, well, this is not this is the product of local densities, but it's not the term coming from the product of local densities. So that would actually be a contribution of C3 times B to the 5, because here you've got a sum of degrees, which is one cubic, three, two linear equations. So the sum of the degrees is 5. So you can see that these grow um, at the same rate, just different constants. And you might ask um, how these are supposed to combine. So the theorem, which is joint with Bruden from this year, is that this, this uh, counting function is precisely the sum of these two things. Um, so in the paper, we get a, an error term which saves a b to the, a positive power of b. You could probably get this as high as a quarter with enough work, I suppose. Um, so, I, so I want to emphasize that what's going on here is that we're really showing that the counting function um, is really identified with the count from the special sub-varieties together with the product of local densities. And these are genuinely um, separate contributions, which both, both have to be accounted for, so provably. Suggesting yep. that in this case, the minor arcs are giving you the same sign, so it's the major Yes, exactly. So um, aha, let me use my fancy eraser. Uh, so I just realized if I hold my notes over here, that's a particularly dangerous thing to do, isn't it? So, OK, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're tempting me to lose it, aren't you? So. <laughs> These are available from Amazon at a very <laughs> modest price. <laughs> and I, I wasn't sponsored to say that. So, uh, um, OK, so yeah, so, so exactly. So, so what's going on here? Um, sorry, say again? Oh, 2b to the 5, thank you. Yeah. So, so exactly, because I've got um, absolute value of x sub i at most b, then the 2b choice is there in the middle there. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, so, and to be, to normalize this all, oh yeah, so that, should, that would be correct. Um, yeah, so, so it's, it's clear. We know, I mean, it's not trivial to, to prove, but it's sort of within the tool set of um, a competent circle method enthusiast to show that the major arcs really do contribute the C3 times 2b to the 5. That's something which, with enough work, you can establish. Um, so that's the major arcs. So of course, all the rest must come from the minor arcs. And in work on, um, for example, work on Manin's conjectures, on Del Pezzo surfaces, things like this, you can see that if you try to use a circle method, the minor arcs must contribute the trivial terms. But that's kind of working with hindsight. You sort of realize that that must have been the case. And you can formally show that the circle method, um, the only explanation would be if the minor arcs contributed the rest. It's not really illuminating. Um, so, so one of the um, aspects of the proof of this result is that you really see that the minor arcs are contributing. Um, you see in real time, visibly, that um, the minor arcs are contributing this 45 times 2b to the 5. And I'd like to, in the last, do I have five minutes? Or um, who, who's in charge? You. You're in charge, yes. 15 minutes. 15 minutes, OK. So, so you, you'll, you should get a, a reasonable. Um, uh, so the idea about how the circle method is going to do this. And in particular, why it is that the, uh, the minor arcs are contributing this, this term. 
So, so let me go back to the notation that I had before. So I'll just remind you because this got erased in the meantime. Um, so, so I have an exponential sum which is at play here. It's the sum of E of alpha 1x cubed plus alpha 2x. And let me remind you that this is real. It's real because I'm summing from minus b to b. And this counting function that we're interested in now, biophogonality, is the integral over the unit cube of f of alpha beta to the 6 times f of alpha gamma to the 4, let's say, d alpha d beta d gamma. Um, so remember, I, as I said, these are, these are real. I'm taking even powers everywhere, so I don't have to worry about the absolute values. Um, and for hardy little dissection that I should use is in some ways simpler than you might expect. So it's for the argument which we used, it was enough to take delta equal to 1 ninth and to define a one-dimensional set of major arcs. So these are now um, the neighborhoods of rationals, uh, sorry, yeah, the neighborhood of rationals with denominators going up to b to the delta, uh, where neighborhood means that the width of the intervals is like b to the delta minus 3. Um, and there's a corresponding set of one-dimensional minor arcs, which is just the complement of a unit interval. And then we can rewrite um, what we're interested in here. So let me write um, one Fourier coefficient. And I'll include a, a minor arc symbol here just to remind me that it corresponds to a set of minor arcs. So it's an integral over minor arcs with respect to the alpha variable and the full interval with respect to the other variable of f of alpha beta to the 6, e of minus n alpha d alpha d beta. Uh, sorry, d beta d alpha. I can't remember right order. Right, so it sort of corresponds to six variables. And another counting function, v of n, um, which you could also write as a Fourier um, integral. So this is counting representations of n as the sum of four cubes, subject to the condition that the four cubes sum to zero and the absolute value is at most b. Okay, so that's two definitions. And then if I sum over integers n in absolute value at most 4b cubed of u of n restricted to these minor arcs, v of n, well, I can just rewrite this as a sum over these four variables which are occurring in v of n with the sum of them being 0, absolute value at most b. Then I've got an integral over minor arcs, integral over 0, 1, f of alpha beta to the 6. And then I get to multiply by e to the 2 pi i minus x1 cubed up to x4 cubed uh, alpha d beta d alpha. OK, so that's um, hopefully sort of what you should never do in at your calculus class. But we're all professional mathematicians, so hopefully that's, that's OK. Um, so I'm going to rewrite this anyway so that it's simpler to, to understand. So, so here, really, what I'm doing is just um, trying to prove to you that uh, Fourier analysis works in a sensible way. 
what it means is that I can rewrite a certain minor arc integral um, I can rewrite this minor arc integral um, as uh, something which makes sense from the definition of the counting function n3 of, of b. So this is, if you like, a minor arc contribution. And I can rewrite that minor arc contribution as the sum over n of u of n restricted to minor arcs times v of n. <coughs> So now we have to do something with this um, if we're going to estimate it successfully. And one observation is that v of n, um, well, if n equals 0, then think about what's going on. We're counting solutions of a sum of four cubes being 0 together with a linear slice. So it's not hard to see that the uh, what you get from the n equals 0 case is a contribution which grows like um, 2b squared with a combinatorial factor 3. And there's an error term which is big O of b. But if n is not equal to 0, then we get to use this uh, polynomial identity, which was used by Bourgain and Heath Brown and actually Hua, all of these guys. And so you can see there that the the growth rate of v of n when n is non-zero is like uh, b to the epsilon. Meanwhile, if I, um, if I uh, compute the size of u of zero restricted to minor arcs, this is um, essentially the same thing as the integral over the unit cube without any twisting Fourier coefficient with a, an error term coming from adding back in the contribution of the major arcs which has small measure it's a special sub variety it turns out it already has small measure and we know what this is exactly so this is the problem we already looked at in, in um, the and n1 of b. So it wouldn't take much work to show that actually this is growing like 15 times 2b cubed plus big O of b to the 2 plus delta from the zero coefficient. So, so this is the mysterious minor arc contribution you're finding in threes. I think it was just coming from the other one. Uh, so we've got a 3 and we've got a 15. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay, Yeah, right. So somehow what we've done is we've split this into two parts. And the minor arcs are seeing that these two parts, parts have separate significance. And, um, and it's sort of naturally identifying what we secretly know is the special subvariety with one particular part of a minor arc contribution. Um, so you can see here that what we've just shown is that um, v of 0 times u of 0 restricted to minor arcs is equal to 45 times 2b to the 5 plus um, smaller order. So that's already giving the main part of the minor arc term. So what we have to do next is to show that the remaining part of the minor arcs definitely contributes something less. And that's where the trick comes in, which I can see uh, I can give you I think I can give you the clue about what, what's going on, and you'll see that this is going to work, even if the details aren't there. So it remains to, uh, 
to show that the sum with n going up to 4b cubed, but non-zero, of uh, v of n, u of n, m, is less than less than b to the 5 minus some positive number. Uh, well, I guess the error I claimed was 1 over 200, didn't I? But, um, and that this is, this is relatively easy. That's the, the sort of a punchline, the joker in the, the, the talk. Um, so observe that uh, what I've written down here, let's call this uh, T. If I just apply Cauchy's inequality, is bounded above by the sum over all these non-zero values of n of u of n m squared to the half times the sum over all these non-zero values of n of v of n squared to the half. Now, for these non-zero values, v of n is like b to the epsilon. So in fact, this whole term here is like b to the 3 plus epsilon. That's a, a consequence of this upper bound of b to the epsilon for the non-zero values. Meanwhile, this first term here, well, we can apply Bessel's inequality. And then what does this look like? Well, this is corresponding to the mean value of a Fourier coefficient. If I think about what this u of nm um, actually looks like, it's sitting right here. So there's going to be an integral over minor x. And I've got two copies of something. So one copy is going to give me an integral of f of alpha beta to the 6, and the other copy an integral um, f of alpha gamma to the 6, d gamma, and I'll put the d beta all the way out here. Um, so this, maybe I can combine it all, is an integral over minor arcs uh, with respect to alpha and integral over the unit square for beta and gamma of f of alpha beta to the 6, f of alpha gamma to the 6, which looks an awful lot like the original counting function n3 of b, doesn't it? And the trick then is just to extract uh, two of these objects. So remember, alpha is sitting on a minor arc, so this is bounded above by the soup over alpha on a minor arc. Um, sup over, let's say, gamma in 0, 1, absolute value of f of alpha gamma squared. And then what's left over is going to be bounded above by n3 of b again. Now we think we know what n3 of b, um, what its size is. It's supposed to be a bit like b to the 5. We don't know that it has an asymptotic formula yet, a priori. Um, so if you accept that it grows like b to the 5, or maybe even b to the 5 plus epsilon, Weyl's inequality saves you something here. You win um, a power depending on, um, well, exactly what definition your, of your minor arcs there are. This is growing like b to the 1 minus delta over 4 plus epsilon for each of these. So this, this integral which we're bounding here, an upper bound for it, which is relatively easy to prove is b to the 7 minus delta over 2 plus epsilon, sort of by bootstrapping. And in fact, if you don't want to be brave enough to say how rapidly this grows to begin with, you can just bury this inside the argument and it extracts itself. So what you can see that from this is that this, this term, this um, extra contribution from the minor arcs, is growing like, well, there's a square root that's going on in both of these factors is growing like b to the 5 minus delta over 8 plus epsilon, something like this. It's a bit smaller than b to the 5. Um, the sort of bootstrapping allows you to do that. 
And that was possible only because we got rid of the n equals zero term, which corresponded to the special subvarieties in the system. So that's the end of the time, and it's also a good place to stop the talk. Um, what I would say is that the punchline from this is that in some special situations, you can program the circle method to automatically pick up the special subvarieties um, in a natural way, which enables you to characterize what goes on on the special subvarieties separately from what goes on away from the special subvarieties. And in both situations, and this one is a, uh, you know, one of the early examples of, of this kind of thing, you can really show that away from the special subvarieties, you de definitely win something on the minor axe. I'm not claiming this is the answer to life, the universe, and everything, because we know that's a sum of three cubes now, but um, um, it, it does allow you to, um, to sort of start to think about how you might try to do this when you're not helped by having linear spaces as your special subvarieties and uh, having linear slices, which feels to me to be, by now anyway, um, cheating a little bit. Okay, so that's, that's the whole caboodle.